everyone. Welcome to our panel today. Uh, just some housekeeping rules before we start. This session does provide interpretation. Please go to interpretation to choose your language channel. Um, we have Arabic translation today and the speakers will be speaking in English. Uh, please do mute, choose mute original audio to hear only the interpreter. everyone to please turn off your videos in order to conserve bandwidth. Uh, please mute, mute your microphones when you aren't speaking as well. Also do close any unnecessary background programs if you're experiencing slow bandwidth. Feel free to use the public chat box to engage with one another. Uh, this session will be streamed live and the recording will remain public on the ERA Asia Pacific YouTube channel. ERA Asia Pacific is committed to making GSWF 2020 an inclusive and safe digital environment. We will not tolerate harassment of any kind, including but not limited to deliberate intimidation or sustained disruption of discussion. Participants are obliged to be respectful and to avoid replicating societal prejudices and inequalities. Participants who engage in disruptive behavior may be removed without prior notice. I'll now pass the session on to our moderator, Isla. Thank you so much for introducing me. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be um, moderating this session on Arab Feminist Civil Society perspective regarding states' policies on economic justice and uh, rights. Uh, the session will uh, begin by presenting two policy papers by the Arab Feminist CSOs, a network on the elimination of gender-based violence and economic justice, and rights. Uh, the papers were uh, developed within the process of preparing for Beijing Plus 25, the Generation Equality Forum uh, 2021, to amplify the, vo the voice of civil society and feminist organizations and push forward uh, the gender equality in our region. Uh, the session will first address shortcomings of government policies in securing economic justice and rights of Arab women, focusing on the informal sector and paid care work, women and entrepreneurship, and women in the technology uh, uh, sector. The session will also address the groups of women who face multiple forms of discrimination, such as rural women, refugee women, and migrant domestic workers and consider different challenges faced by women uh, impede them from being economically active and from securing uh, decent work, including uh, uh, macroeconomic obstacles and limited access to resources, discriminatory laws and insufficient legal protection, adverse social norms and sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh, the presentation will also discuss what needs to be achieved from our gov Arab governments in the coming five years in order to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women, including young women and persons with disabilities and other disadvantaged groups with equal pay for work uh, of equal value. The session will also <clears throat> present the different uh, uh, forms of violence that Arab women suffer from and how this discourages women from being economically active. It will uh, also address the failure of legal frameworks and the death of services, the dearth of services available for survivors, victims of violence in the majority of Arab countries that result in women enduring different forms of violence. Uh, it is a great pleasure to present uh, um, the speakers. Uh, we have uh, today uh, four speakers. All, all, all of them are uh, renownedly known in our region. Uh, and uh, of course, they have uh, long years of experience of a struggle and um, activism uh, for the uh, promotion of women's rights uh, in our region. I present first uh, Dr. Fatma Khafagi, 
she is from Egypt. She is the, uh, uh, the co-convener of the network and coordinator of Arab Women Network for Parity and Solidarity. One of the 20 members of the civil society advisory group, uh, Generation Equality Forums. She has a PhD in development planning from University College London and has over 35 years experience working with civil society and with UN agencies and other uh, donors on gender, justice and equality issues. The second speaker will be Mrs. Uh, Samia El Malki from Tunisia. Uh, she is the president of a Kadirat NGO in Tunisia and vice coordinator of the ERA network, a member of the Arab States Feminist CSOs network and member of the steering committee of SUWAR, Solidarity of African Women Rights Organization. She will present the challenges facing Arab women in accessing economic justice and rights and the policy recommendations uh, presented to Arab government. The third speaker will be Mrs. Fatima Abu Talib from Morocco. Uh, Fatima, uh, she has several years of experience advocating and lobbying for women's human rights with local, regional, and international organizations with a special focus on gender-based violence survivors, responsive mechanisms and, uh, system, and systems. Currently, Fatima Utalib is North, uh, uh, North South Council of Europe, pool of expert member to today. Uh, she uh, represents our region, MENA region, at the board on the global network of women's shelters GNWS Feminist Alliance for Rights, uh, uh, FAR, FAR Steering Committee member, ABAD Advisory Board member, Karama Network member, UAF Morocco Women Shelter Director. The uh, last and final uh, speaker will be Mrs. Uh, Zaina Abdel Khalaf from Lebanon. Uh, she is a feminist and human rights advocate with a master in public health from American University of Beirut. She is certified gender trainer from KIT, KIT, uh, the uh, Netherlands. She works as gender consultant for international organizations and is currently the coordinator of the Arab State Feminist CSOs Network. She will present the case of Lebanon, how gender-based violence negatively impact the economic uh, participation of women in uh, Lebanon. So I will give the speaker, each speakers around uh, um, uh, 10 minutes to speak and we will have at the end of the session around 20 minutes uh, will be dedicated to questions and answer and comments from the floor. So let, let, us, let me welcome first Dr. Fatma Khafagi as the first speaker. And it was a great pleasure to be part of this event uh, from our region. Dr. Fatma, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Islah. Good morning and good evening to, to all. Um, I'm so happy and honored to be in this session and to reconnect with Euro, uh, a very esteemed and value, uh, valued uh, NGO that we all value also in the Arab region. Uh, I thought I want to tell you a little bit of the background of our network before I, I leave the floor to uh, my colleagues to tell you about uh, part of what we're doing. Uh, our network, which is the Arab civil society, uh, feminist civil society organizations in the Arab region, um, was actually formed uh, in March. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, it was formed in uh, last uh, in March 2020 uh, when the uh, COVID-19 uh, broke up. And we came together, we're now about uh, uh, 45 uh, civil society, feminist civil society organizations uh, from the majority of Arab countries, around 15 Arab countries. And we came together because we were very much alarmed uh, of the impact of COVID-19 on women in the Arab region. So we came together to discuss uh, because most of us are working on the ground with, with needy women. And we wanted to uh, actually uh, uh, increase and also uh, coordinate of what we are doing on the ground uh, in order to uh, um, decrease the impact of COVID-19 on women. Uh, but, and also to look at the government uh, uh, policies and services in response to COVID-19 and their impact on women. Uh, but uh, since the start of our meetings, we found out that COVID-19 did not actually uh, invent problems for women. It increases them, uh, it, uh, it really magnified them. So we said we want to look at the structural uh, inequalities in the Arab region uh, also, and not only to look at the uh, impact of COVID-19. So that's how we started uh, actually our work since uh, March 2020. Next slide, please. Um, some of us also happen to be uh, uh, linked to what is happening uh, globally uh, in the Generation Equality Forum, uh, uh, some of us are members in the CSAG, the Civil Society Advisory Group to the core group, uh, working very much, most of us on Beijing 25. Uh, so we also said we want to have uh, a strong voice as Arab women to influence the agenda that the whole uh, world is engaged in putting for the five coming, uh, for the coming five years. So we also said uh, this is one of our uh, uh, main objective to have a strong voice uh, globally as well, not only regionally, not only nationally, but also uh, globally. Next, please. Uh, so we put as our objectives to galvanize the different feminist groups of civil society in the Arab uh, countries uh, in order to mitigate the effects of the pandemic on Arab women and also to look and address the structural uh, injustices and inequalities uh, and to have the strong uh, voice for Arab women. Uh, and to uh, actually uh, give our perspective in what is happening uh, um, regionally and, and uh, globally. Next, please. Uh, we uh, said that we, we were not very pleased with the uh, government policies uh, in response to COVID-19 and also in response to the uh, long endured uh, inequalities and injustices uh, facing Arab women. So we said we want to focus on policies to see the gaps and loopholes in the policies and suggest you know, more of, of, of structural and transformational uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, we also said that it's very important for us to uh, share the experiences and especially uh, we found out when we, we hold our regular meetings that there are very good practices that need to be replicated or taken to scale in the region. So we also focus on this uh, good practices. Next, please. Uh, we also said, because there is in the Arab region, uh, and I think in, in many other regions as well, a shrinking space for civil society. So we are trying by coming together to call for opening space for civil society and to, I mean, working together really would uh, pave the way for us to have a stronger uh, voice vis-a-vis -vis our governments. Next, please. So these are the three things that we uh, focus on, uh, is to build up a regional feminist movement 
that has leadership and can participate in, in all decision uh, making processes in curbing gender injustice and transforming the systematic uh, the systemic gender discriminatory structures in the Arab countries. And we also uh, share data information experiences to learn from each other uh, and to ensure that the needs and voices of the marginalized groups in the region are heard. So we, we very much keen on uh, having with us and also addressing the special needs of the marginalized groups like refugees, migrants, LGBTQI, um, female uh, domestic workers, and women with disabil uh, disabilities. Next, please. Uh, what we do and our outputs um, until now, the policy briefs that address decision makers in our countries. Uh, we also suggest legal reform because uh, of the of the many uh, um, uh, legal discriminatory uh, frameworks we have, and we also try to assess uh, the services that are in place and also to call for uh, more services. Uh, quantity-wise and quality-wise. Uh, we look at the good practices and, and, and call for their replication. Uh, and also we uh, link with what's happening globally and try to influence the feminist agenda for the coming five years. Next, please. Uh, until now, we, we have managed to address uh, four themes, and they link actually with the Global Action Coalitions, uh, violence against women and girls, and, and uh, my colleague Fatma from Morocco uh, will deal with that. Uh, we also are producing right now a, a, a policy paper on bodily integrity, sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, we have produced a policy paper on economic justice and decent work for women and my colleague Samia from Tunisia will present this today. And we have also produced a policy paper on women, uh, peace and security. Uh, so uh, uh, this is um, uh, what we are uh, doing since uh, March and we're continuing uh, with a strategic plan for the five coming years. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. And I leave the floor now to uh, the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatma, uh, for the um, comprehensive uh, presentation. And I will uh, move now to the second speaker, Mrs. Samia Al-Malki from Tunisia, please. Yes, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to tell you how happy I am, although this is a very early, very early in the morning in Tunisia, but I'm very happy to be with you today. So today I'm going to introduce uh, the economic justice uh, paper. Um, <clears throat> let me, uh, yes, okay. So, um, sorry. Do you, can you see the, my screen? Yes, we can yes. see it very clearly. Thank you. Yes, very good. So um, as Dr. Uh, um, uh, Fatma said, uh, it is, uh, this policy paper is part of a series of uh, policy papers uh, on the uh, uh, four gender thematic areas that she already introduced. And um, the study or the policy paper found that uh, there was a, a big gap between uh, women's improved education in all of the Arab countries and the uh, uh, limited participation in economic activities uh, in several Arab countries. Uh, well, the Arab region, unfortunately, has the lowest uh, rate of female labor force participation, just 18.4% uh, compared to a global average of 48%. This is the sad situation. Um, all this is due, I'm going just to cite a few factors, vulnerable employment, uh, which is informal uh, mostly, 
uh, political instability and conflicts in the region, just like in Libya, Yemen, um, Syria, many parts of the world, and paid care work uh, and technology uh, gap. As far as uh, unpaid uh, uh, paid work, uh, it was found that unpaid children work results in women spending almost five times more hours than men on unpaid care work. So um, they care for children, for the elderly. Uh, so um, most of uh, Arab women, um, I mean, compared to men who on, uh, of which only 26% of which uh, do the same uh, think so it's a burden for women uh, and 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 this unpaid work unfortunately does not decrease when they join the labor force the uh, one of the other uh, problem is the technology uh, gap uh, there is a big digital gender gap in the arab region uh, the percentage of arab females who access and use the internet is just 36.9% compared to 46 0.2% of uh, Arab male. So um, this, uh, the, the, the study found that women are facing multiple forms of discrimination uh, in the, uh, at work. Uh, and uh, um, rural women are uh, part of, the, I mean, face multiple forms of discrimination. They are economically uh, abused. Uh, refugee women, LGBTQI women, female migrant domestic workers, uh, all these women, uh, for instance, um, mean uh, women are more concentrated in the agriculture sector, for example, if we talk about uh, rural women, 70% uh, in Tunisia of women uh, um, of the agriculture's uh, workforce uh, so uh, is female, sorry. In some countries such as Jordan, many rural women uh, are precarious, daily wage workers working on large forms. Uh, as, uh, for refugee women uh, are usually isolated, subject to legal restrictions, etc. And uh, LGBTQI women, it's another major group facing discrimination and challenges. Um, they are the ones most discriminated against in the organized workforce. No protection laws, constant exposure to blackmail and harassment due to, our, to their uh, identities. And uh, finally, female uh, um, migrant uh, workers. Uh, so um, we all know, uh, yesterday I attended, <coughs> I attended the, uh, a webinar where they were talking uh, specifically about female migrant domestic workers and some countries have uh, during COVID especially uh, they did they just got rid of them and and placed them in front of their uh, embassies uh, to uh, uh, without paying them or paying them less than what they deserve so <clears throat> um there are compounded economic impacts on women caused by COVID, and we cannot uh, we cannot uh, just uh, talk about uh, uh, economic justice without talking about the period of COVID, which unveiled more economic injustice and unveiled the uh, vulnerability of women. So um, uh, the estim estimates show that uh, women will lose approximately seven hundred. A thousand jobs as a result of COVID-19, uh, and uh, the crisis has shown that the fragmented social protection systems are incapable of protecting the more uh, vulnerable. Um, the challenges. The study has shown that there are uh, some macroeconomic obstacles and limited access to resources lack of job creation, decreasing uh, foreign and domestic investment. Uh, Arab women do not have equal rights to economic uh, research uh, or access to ownership. 
uh, there is the problem of <laughs> inheritance and natural resources. Uh, while in Tunisia we are asking of, for equal uh, inheritance rights, uh, there are parts, even in Tunisia and, uh, and in the other Arab countries, where women simply do not inherit because uh, they don't want her to. Uh, challenges, uh, more challenges, discriminatory laws that uh, Dr. Fatma has uh, referred to, insufficient legal uh, protection, and adverse social norms a big problem in the Arab uh, world, sexual harassment uh, at uh, workplace, which uh, really um, uh, sometimes prohibits women to, uh, uh, it's one of the big reasons why women do not, uh, are not so present in the uh, labor force. Uh, so um, the goal of the study uh, really is to adopt and implement uh, policy, legal frameworks, innovative uh, solutions, and especially shift, uh, create a shift in, institu in institutional culture and in the mindset, because it's really about the mindset and the mentality of both women and men. Uh, to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women. So, um, including uh, young women and persons with disabilities. The recommendations the papers have come up with are um, universal social protection and legal uh, frameworks, better uh, recognition of the unremunerated care work, elimination of the digital gap, collection of gendered, uh, data which is missing in a lot of countries. Uh, so um, now uh, uh, the um, um, paper has also identified, like all the other papers, we follow the same pattern, uh, give recommendations to decision makers and to governments, and then uh, pick a regional best practice. And here, uh, we picked uh, the index, which is prepared and implemented by the Arab Women Feminist Union in six Arab countries that represent the six regions, uh, the Arab Mashraq, the Arab Maghreb, and the Gulf states. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, each uh, uh, region is represented by two countries. So these are Egypt and Sudan from the Arab uh, Mashraq, Tunisia and Algeria from the Arab Maghreb, and uh, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia uh, from the Gulf. Uh, and uh, because I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just uh, uh, answer any question about this uh, best practice. So this policy paper was prepared by Dr. Fatma Khafeji and Zina uh, Abdul Khalak. Thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to me. Uh, okay. I'll, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Samia, and thank, thank you for respecting uh, uh, the, the time allocated for your paper. I will move now to the following speaker, uh, Dr. Fatma Boutali from Morocco. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, morning everybody. I'm not a doctor, uh, just Fatima Boutali from Morocco. Uh, morning everybody, thank you, Era for this opportunity. Thank you, Fatima, for organizing it and making it possible for all of us. Uh, I would like to share with you, I'll be talking about gender-based violence, uh, its prevalence uh, indicators and uh, uh, discriminatory laws, uh, women, uh, violence against women, uh, which are really, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to share my 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 screen is that okay yeah hello yes very good we can good. see it. good so uh, as i said i'll be sharing with you some uh, part of the work which has been elaborated and designed by women in uh, in the Arab uh, network, feminist uh, networks and uh, CSOs, uh, uh, women. And uh, all this, of course, thanks to 
people coordinating uh, the work and I'm really proud to be part of this, uh, this group. So uh, my task today is to share with you the outcome, the policy paper uh, on gender-based uh, violence, uh, on gender-based violence. So uh, as you can see, it's, uh, the aim is to amplify the voices of women and girls. And before saying anything about what's going on, and I, th I think you all know the, the prevalence and uh, the extent of violence women are subjected to in our Arab region, I would like to, to recognize that some Arab states indicate a willingness to combat gender-based violence, and, and also civil society, they have, uh, uh, they have conducted numerous endless efforts uh, to remedy, to address the issue of gender-based violence, but yet the picture is still bleak and women and girls in the region continue to be challenged by laws, policies, that perpetrate inequalities and gender-based violence. So, uh, ending violence, pushing forward uh, the gender equality agenda, that's what we are doing. Yet, as I said, women and girls in the Arab region continue to be challenged by laws, policies that perpetrate gender-based violence deeply uh, enshrined gender norms, practices that influence uh, the relationship and balance relationships, family and institutional power dynamics, insufficient accountability mechanisms, all leading to increased gender-based uh, violence. And also without forgetting the under-reporting uh, uh, under -reporting of violence because as we uh, as for example in Morocco three only three percent of women report the violence they 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 are subjected to in their in their lives though for example in Morocco 62 percent of women between 18 and uh, 60 I think uh, have been subjected to violence 48 percent uh, suffer from psychological violence so under COVID, of course, uh, we can say that uh, gender uh, inequalities have worsened, exacerbated. Why? Because of the failure in response to gender-based violence in the Arab countries during this pandemic. And uh, particularly, uh, it was manifested in the lack of uh, preparedness for the search of domestic violence cases, the lack of gender responsive policies to the pandemic, but also the lack of availability and access to state protection services in terms of shelters, financial and legal support. And I can here, for example, relate how difficult it was for us uh, who, I mean, NGOs, for example, in Morocco, and I think, I guess, ev uh, everywhere in the Arab region, where women have uh, mobilized to establish online uh, uh, consultations and assistance platforms, and where, where we managed, for example, to reach out to women, but we couldn't um, take them out of, of the places where they are locked in with their perpetrators simply because of the lockdown, but also because of the lack of shelters and also because of these, the shelters which exist, they are not well equipped uh, safety-wise, health-wise to receive the, these women. So women got stuck uh, with their perpetrators and uh, a study conducted in Egypt, for example, I'll give here Egypt as, a, as an example, but uh, I think uh, what's happening in Egypt is also happening in, in Lebanon, in Morocco, Tunisia, everywhere. So a study conducted in Egypt in May 2020 by Center for Egyptian Women, uh, legal, women's legal, uh, uh, 
by center. Anyway, uh, May 22 showed that 70% of the women who were living with men during the have uh, with men during the pandemic have faced violence. So it is a very alarming figure here. And as I said, similar happened uh, in Morocco and everywhere in the Arab region. Uh, I will also share with you some findings of uh, from images survey for MENA region, 2017, 10 to 45% of men, male partners here, husband or, or, or uh, anyway, companion, uh, having practiced violence, admit having practiced violence against women, and same number of women affirming having experienced violence, 25.6 in Egypt, 19% uh, in Jordan, uh, and 20 in Tunisia. Uh, another study by the Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development uh, found uh, 75.3 of Jordanian women subjected to uh, were subjected uh, to uh, to sexual harassment in uh, in uh, uh, at work, but unfortunately they did not even consider legal action. And and, and here again, women in our region. Uh, don't report. Very few of them report, and if they go to 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 seek help in uh, crisis centers, shelters, etc., with with NGOs, types of violence. Very few types of violence. They are they are uh, multiple. But here I will I will share with you uh, some of them. Violence in the workplace. As I said, the figure is seventy five point three percent of Jordanian women. As I just said, uh, mm, witnessed sexual uh, violence at work, gender-based violence in social network. And here there is another emerging form of, of violence which has been exacerbated during uh, this pandemic. It is, the, it is the violence in social network and via the internet. Moroccan study, 13.5 Moroccan women subjected to internet violence. And this is a really, this is because it is invisible and because of the lack of witnesses, it is very, it is prevailing and, and its impact is more uh, severe, I think. Violence against women, human rights defenders, and we cannot really go uh, past this uh, momentum without really uh, talking about what's happening in our region, women, Human rights defenders are facing escalating threats and intimidation acts. They are silenced, intimidated, and banned from traveling to, to uh, they are also imprisoned, and they are killed. And this is, and we uh, I personally, and all of us have friends who were, who either they were banned from traveling, or they were imprisoned, or they were killed. And we have a very famous names like Selwa, like others uh, in Libya, everywhere. Violence against we uh, against the child, the girl child, which is also uh, manifested in uh, FGM and child marriage, but also recently uh, in recruitment by Melissa's, uh, and we saw. Uh, young uh, boys being dragged in 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 those in the Yemen, for example, conflict and everywhere uh, they are they are used. I'll give you a number: uh, uh, around 50 million girls and women have undergone FGM, Egypt in Egypt, Sudan, Djibouti, Iraq, and Yemen, and this is very alarming. 24. Thousand percent of we, of uh, young girls uh, have have seen uh, have been married in in Morocco. They are underage, and uh, the the laws uh, the the uh, the judge unfortunately has the right to marry them. So we have we have numbers alarming numbers of early marriages in Morocco. Challenges. What challenges to to overcome? Uh, I don't know. I, I will. I will like to if I tell you we have framed them or or shaped them in 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 the ones that I have here in my slide. They are multiple, and uh, their severity uh, and the degree and their impact is also uh, is the same. And uh, uh, my yeah. Dear. Please. Sorry, I know. So the legal framework, the social norm, norms, as I said, the service provisions, which are scarce, 
inadequate in our country. Women are uh, also dis facing discrimination. Recommendations, we want uh, special laws on eliminating gender-based violence. We want uh, our uh, states to ratify ILO convention. Uh, we want uh, our states to, to, uh, to ensure due diligence in implementing laws on GBV, reform uh, family laws, enforce protection schemes for women human rights defenders, enact specific laws like domestic uh, um, laws, uh, anti-domestic violence laws, uh, also online as well as specialized mechanism uh, with trained and skilled professionals required uh, to confront and eliminate uh, uh, gender-based uh, violence. Uh, last but not least, so changing prevalence social norms uh, pertaining to victims, blaming and stigmatization of women, ensuring provision of survival centered services, enhancing coordination and strengthening partnership between government, CSOs, academic institutions, donors, local communities and the private sector. I think I have gone through our policy paper. Uh, and uh, I'll be expecting questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fatima Utali from Morocco. And now I move to Mrs. Uh, Zina Abdel Falek from uh, Lebanon. Uh, so please take the floor. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you. I'm going to be showing my screen to uh, present the case of Lebanon. Very good, we can see the screen. Now you're able to see the screen. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, the Lebanese woman status quo has always been highly to edge. On one hand, there's wide emancipation, others participation in the cultural and social life, gender parity in the fields of education and health. But on the other hand, there's uh, significant inequalities in the economic, political, and decision-making spheres and striking discrimination in the personal status laws where we have 15 according to the different sex present in Lebanon. Lebanese state has ratified CEDAW in 1997, but with reservations to articles pertaining to uh, nationality and uh, equality in marriage and family relations. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Zena, could you please slow down for the interpretation, please? Okay, just, sure. Just, thank yes, you so sure. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, the Lebanese Labour Code, contain, a code contains discriminatory measures towards women. It doesn't define or prohibit workplace sexual harassment. It doesn't ma mandate child care support by employers or the government, neither flexible or part-time schedule or equal remuneration for work of equal value. In 2019, the total labor force participation was 48.8%, with women's participation being only 29.3% compared to 70.7% for, for men. Uh, women in Lebanon, um, uh, they have un unpaid time burden that are significant. Uh, they, it's on average 60 hours per week uh, women spend on unpaid care work. So as we can see from the graph, uh, we see the usual trend, whereas it peaks, uh, uh, women's participation peaks uh, in their 20s and then declines in their 13s once they decide to start a family uh, and have children. Uh, sometimes they have to choose between having a career or, uh, or a family. Uh, the images survey in 2016 showed that 31% of women in Lebanon reported ever experiencing one or more forms of intimate partner violence. Uh, in 2014, the Lebanese state enacted Law 293, uh, Law on Domestic uh, Law on Protection of Women and Other Family Members from Domestic Violence. Uh, however, the law uh, did, didn't define or refer to GBV, and it fails to criminalize uh, marital rape. Although many definitions require clarification, um, some judgments from courts applying Law 293 have supported a broad interpretation of the definition of acts of violence, but this was related to the personal initiative of the judge rather than to the legal text itself. Uh, the penal code has articles still uh, that lesser punishment for crimes committed in the name of honor and doesn't specify um, uh, punishments for crimes of sexual violence. 
Also in Lebanon, we haven't established a national minimum age for marriage, and we completely delegate this responsibility to religious authorities, uh, where in some cases, these laws uh, permit girls as young as nine to marry. Uh, the uh, um, the women facing multiple forms of discrimination, for instance, L LBTQI persons who already confront structure, structural marginalization, including sexual harassment, black, blackmail, and underpayment, faced worsening, worsened conditions with the financial crisis and the lockdown, lockdown measures of COVID-19. Um, Syrian and Palestinian refugees here, I like to note that Lebanon has the highest uh, ratio uh, of um, uh, refugee per capita. So uh, this is very significant in Lebanon, the refugee population. Uh, so Syrian and Palestinian refugees, including many long-term residents, remain subject to discriminatory laws and refugee women continue to be excluded from many types uh, of work, uh, from owning or inheriting property and from accessing public education and health services and are particularly vulnerable to harassment, sexual violence and exploitation. Uh, women who face multiple forms of discrimination, lack access to technology and information, and, and are unable to receive vital information around GBV services. They're unable to connect to organizations that, uh, that could- Sina, please help. slow down, please, my dear, because it's <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. so difficult for the interpretation. I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, the pandemic hit Lebanon in 2019 uh, at a very critical moment where we were facing political instability and unpre unprecedented financial and economic crisis. The expected uh, contraction in GDP uh, between 2017 and 2020 is expected to be 25%, which will reduce employment by 16.25%. Uh, more than 106 thousand uh, expected job losses uh, and they will definitely affect disproportionately uh, men and women uh, and they will result in an increase of women's employment in precarious work. Uh, the crisis is also set to harm women's physical and mental health as well as maternal and infant mortality rates which we were happy that we had achieved the SDGs uh, on this component. Uh, the crisis may uh, alter all this and that this will be particularly alarming for women refugees in Lebanon, the access to quality health services. Uh, and if not handled properly, the crisis will curb women's institutional rights and advancement. And I'm sorry for uh, speaking very quickly, but I'm done. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Zina Abdelkale. And uh, as we uh, heard, the uh, four uh, speakers gave uh, a rather uh, bleak image about women's situation in our region. And uh, it is no surprising because as you might know, the region is the hub of different forms of violence, uh, whether internal uh, conflicts or uh, wars and aggressions uh, by external uh, perpetrators, which led to a massive number of displaced and refugee people, uh, of course, and this weighs heavily on all infrastructural uh, and uh, social services uh, uh, provided uh, by uh, the governments, and they are initially uh, scarce and limited. I open the floor now for the audience. If uh, you have any questions or any comments, uh, it will be a great pleasure for all of us to receive uh, your questions and comments. You can raise your hand, of course, on the screen using uh, uh, the participants uh, icon and you have uh, at the lower edge of the participants list, uh, you can raise your hand. Any questions, comments? Um, any feedback from the speakers or if any of the speakers want to add or clarify any of the raised points in their uh, um, presentations?
No? <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, please do. Go on. Um, just a general question to all the speakers. Uh, do you feel like um, with what's happened with COVID now and all this work that everybody's been doing, that this will make things better for the future? Uh, any of the speakers uh, can uh, answer this question? Yes, any speakers. Uh, okay, can I? Yes, please, Dr. Fatma. Okay. Uh, yes, I think um, there are silver lining when we talk about COVID-19 uh, uh, because I think also in uh, in some of our countries in the Arab region, there was a denial of certain uh, problems um, that women face. Uh, now with COVID-19 and really how it magnified the problems, I think it's very, and we have, you know, evidence from the ground. So it is, it has become um, difficult for governments uh, to deny the extent of uh, struggle that women are facing. Uh, this is one thing. The, the other thing that is happening now, uh, because we have so much also uh, security restrictions and, and uh, restrictions on civil society organizations and so on, and even on, on, on our meetings in some of the countries, now uh, virtually we can really meet everybody. Uh, so there is not a problem of taking a security permission or a entry visa or something. So we meet regularly from all over uh, the Arab uh, countries and with other, uh, uh, you know, uh, participants from other parts of the world, and we talk freely and so on. So, um, I mean, with all, all the bad things that COVID has uh, brought for women, but there are certain, you know, uh, positive changes that we are seeing happening also that we want to capitalize on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. And we have a question now to uh, Fatima Boutar yeah. from uh, Humay Abdel Rafour. So did you read the question or shall I read yeah. it? No, I, re I read the question. It's about okay, uh, the reform to, to the, of the family of, the, of the, what is called the Mudawana, yes, that happened in 2004. Uh, no one can deny that uh, uh, it was a milestone, uh, and uh, from that uh, we can say that uh, it was the biggest ever achievement uh, women have uh, got or attained so far in Morocco. But I can say that there are gaps and uh, I elucidated uh, some gaps in, even in my presentation, it's early marriage, for example. Article 19, 20 and 21 still allow the judge to marry, to contract uh, marriages of underage girls. And the figures presented by the, the Ministry of Justice are very alarming. No one can deny that. Uh, the, the tutorship or the legal guardianship is still in the hands of the man. Uh, even if divorced, a woman uh, cannot have the legal guardianship of her children. She still needs the, the, the man the, 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 to permit her to deal with whatever, any single stuff, uh, legal stuff uh, concerning her children. Uh, property sharing is still uh, a big matter. So we do have, there are st uh, still gaps in the family law which should be addressed dealt with the penal code, the, the violence is still not considering uh, the holistic uh, uh, aspect of, of, uh, of violence and the individuality of women as individuals. Women are still considered as, as part of the family. And even with the change with the new law domestic, on domestic violence, it is only addressing heavily sexual harassment, but it doesn't really, it doesn't address marital rape, it doesn't address really important issues which are relevant to our daily life, to women's daily lives. So, uh, and it's not holistic, it, it, there is no prevention. 
and on that, uh, and that's one of the things we have also highlighted in the policy paper. The five P's are not really ad addressed. Prosecution is not addressed. Uh, perpetrators, there are there are gaps in the laws which allow perpetrators uh, still to beat and batter the women without being judged. And it's always very difficult to have witnesses. Uh, yet, yet I can say that Morocco is, uh, when it comes to the legal framework, more or less it has it has it has been reformed in a way to guarantee uh, part of women's rights. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fatima Talib. Uh, I will just give a few um, uh, minutes to uh, uh, Zena. She wants just to clarify one point that she mentioned in her presentation. Uh, to Samia. Uh, Samia, Samia, not, uh, Samia Al Marki, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So um, there was uh, a best practice that uh, I wanted to uh, clarify and um, that I spoke uh, about. Uh, it's uh, really about uh, an indica indicators that were uh, developed by the General Arab Women uh, Federation. They, 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 uh, they developed a, a, a regional index, the first of its ki kind in the region. What does it do? It provides a culture uh, specific, better understanding of the factors uh, really which uh, uh, impact the economic empowerment of Arab uh, women uh, in six uh, countries uh, of the region. So it uh, identifies the factors that influence the economic and social decisions made by the women in the private and, uh, and public spheres. Uh, the index identified uh, uh, 21 indicators to measure the environment attributes for uh, uh, Arab women uh, empowerment. These categories are, um, for instance, uh, economic participation. They have four indicators, uh, 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 freedom of mobility, six indicators, decision-making uh, 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 in home family management, uh, uh, three indicators, social and political participation, one indicator, resistance to domestic, uh, especially intimate uh, partner violence, uh, it's uh, two indicators, and resistance to harassment in a public uh, a space, in public spaces, two indicators, and finally, value of basic uh, education, one indicator. So this, uh, uh, this index can really be uh, replicated in other countries and, and, and can be used regularly on, in all the Arab uh, countries to measure the economic and social empowerment of Arab women. So this is one of the, of the uh, good practice that uh, has been identified by uh, uh, the researchers uh, in, uh, in the policy uh, and put in the policy paper. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Samia. We have another questions from Shanti. Shanti, on the first day of GSWF, we had a session about the kafala system. How can CSOs from Arab regions and the source uh, countries of women migrant domestic workers work collectively to abolish the kafala system? Uh, any uh, respondent to that? Um, I think Dr. Fatma could answer that. Uh, yeah, and I also think uh, Zina could, but there are many actually um, uh, CSOs now in the different Arab countries um, are uh, addressing this kafala practice and criticizing it very much and also uh, sort of, of um, uh, reporting how much really uh, from, from, from individual cases, how much it hurts um, my, uh, female migrant uh, uh, workers at home. And uh, so there is a lot actually of work and struggle by feminist CSOs in different Arab countries to change uh, this uh, kafala. In, in, in some of the Gulf countries, 
it has been uh, reformed a bit, not to the maximum that we want, but a bit actually. Uh, <clears throat> if you are interested, we can share with you uh, some of the <clears throat> examples of how uh, the kafala system was changed in the Gulf countries. Um, uh, and I think in Lebanon also, uh, uh, lots of work is has been done in order to change this uh, kafala system and eliminate it. Zena, if you want to add anything, please do. Uh, yeah, uh, there was the unified contract in Lebanon, uh, uh, which came uh, because of the lobbying of the various uh, uh, NGOs working on uh, this issue. Um, it shows also uh, there were many studies implemented and they showed that the kafala system, for instance, in Lebanon uh, is a burden uh, even on the employers. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, so options should be sought uh, to change the kafala system. Um, and uh, it's a very good idea uh, for having like uh, coordination between feminists in the Arab world and the feminists from source uh, countries of uh, migrant domestic workers. Yeah. So, thank you, Zaina. Actually, uh, we have to clarify that the kafala system exists only in the Arab uh, Gulf countries and doesn't exist in all the rest of the Arab countries. And as uh, Dr. Fatma mentioned, there are some uh, improvements lately uh, concerning the conditions of the contracts that allow migrant workers <clears throat> to leave the country without the uh, permission of their, um, uh, their uh, employers. And also, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, activism of feminist organizations in our region. We have countries now that uh, allowed, with the support of the ILO, uh, to uh, conclude contracts with the migrant workers, as in Jordan and, uh, as Zaina mentioned, also uh, in Lebanon. So having uh, contracts with clear conditions also help uh, migrant uh, workers, women, uh, to have uh, some rights. Uh, we have another question, I think, uh, from uh, Audrey. Uh, uh, can, uh, earlier, it was mentioned that ownership access to land was also a challenge uh, for women economic rights. On, uh, so in MENA, uh, in our region, Yani, is uh, redistributive agrarian land law reform, like what some groups are working on in other regions or family law reform uh, uh, entry point that the Arab feminist collective working on that creates an urge, uh, an urgency agenda for uh, changing discriminatory uh, structures. Uh, okay, uh, anyone from the speakers want to take this question, please? It's about inheritance and discriminatory law. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think. Uh, sorry, Fatma, do you want to no, go ahead? No, no, you go, go ahead. Uh, if you can speak about uh, Tunisia and Morocco, and I think Tamia has something to say. But for yeah, us, for example, in Morocco, uh, it is it is uh, it is on the agenda. It is one of the priorities of uh, of. Uh, of uh, not all NGOs, unfortunately, but uh, uh, women NGOs, and uh, we we introduced uh, the the topic and the, the concern, and uh, it it had uh, uh, reactions, counter reactions from the Islamists, and uh, we were told that the momentum is not. Uh, prosperous now i mean i mean it's not convenient now for us to launch such a topic such an issue uh, but we are preparing for that we are preparing now uh, studying and uh, really preparing our arguments because uh, we it's something it is it is one of the milestones we will uh, really we want to uh, we want to to how can I say to launch and to work on as a, as a coalition of Moroccan NGOs, uh, and we are preparing for that. We are preparing with uh, mainly with uh, with uh, I don't know Asma Al Marabt, for example, one of the no notorious figures working on uh, Islam, uh, 
uh, and and uh, feminism and also other other uh, figures with religious background and who are more enlightened enlightened and with which we are seeking support and uh, and uh, arguments uh, plausible argu arguments for our uh, for our uh, advocacy campaign because we know that it's tough we know that that the counter reaction and the other the conservatives are there and uh, it's not it won't be an easy fight but we we will uh, we will we'll carry it on whatever the price whatever time it will take it doesn't matter but we will be there like yani uh, like our friends in tunisia there is no way we can't Okay, can I, may I? Uh, Dr. Khafagi, would you like to add anything to what uh, uh, Mrs. Fatma have just mentioned? Okay, just quickly, actually, maybe uh, the Mashriq countries in the Arab region are a bit different than the Maghrib. I mean, um, I mean, uh, especially also Tunisia are more advanced in addressing uh, uh, the equal rights in, in inheritance, which we find very difficult uh, in the Mashriq, actually. And I, I mean, we've been really working very hard on family law, and it's so difficult when it's really related to uh, religion and to Islam uh, and to the strict interpretation of Islam. But for, for the past 20 years, I, in, in Egypt, for instance, we've been uh, trying to reform the family law because the whole concept it's built on is really a sort of, of very much restricting the role uh, of women uh, because it's based on that the man is the one who provides and the woman has to obey. Uh, uh, and this really restricts her movement, her mobility, uh, her work, her education, her even... Um, uh, rejecting violence and so on. But there's so much actually work on this. And every now and then we have a little bit of legal reform, but we want to change the whole philosophy uh, of the family law. Thank you. Uh, may you I say something? Uh, uh, I, I just want to add one uh, small point because the, um, uh, the question was about what is better as an entry point, the agrarian uh, uh, land, the agrarian reform uh, law, or the you know the family law? In general, approaching family law with the reforms is much more difficult than other laws, and uh, the, the agrarian question is not that developed in in our uh, area. So it's uh, catch twenty two. So I move now to Samia. She wants to add something. Please, Samia, go ahead. Hello. Yes, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, the raging debate that has been going on for uh, uh, some time now in Tunisia about uh, uh, the equality and in inheritance. And actually, there has been a law um, proposed uh, for uh, a draft uh, that was uh, adopted by the uh, um, uh, the, the Council of the Ministers, but uh, that is stuck now in the uh, uh, Parliament um, because, of course, um, it was uh, um, uh, handed uh, at the time of the elections and because it's a very, very controversial uh, subject and because it requires courage, uh, uh, the uh, candidates did not want to, at that time, uh, and the parties did not want to put it on the table uh, because uh, each one wants to score points and that was not a popular subject. The society is uh, still uh, a conserv a big part of the society is still conservative when it comes uh, uh, to that point. Um, it's not really conservative as, as uh, such, but anything that has to do with uh, 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 it, uh, I mean, with money, let's say it, <laughs> uh, anything that could really um, um, uh, challenge uh, the authority of the uh, male over uh, property um, is not welcome. Uh, a Tunisian might go to the, uh, uh, to, to the bar and drink, might not give uh, 
the inheritance, the part that uh, his sisters are entitled to. But when it comes to when it comes to uh, uh, accepting equality and in inheritance, he will invoke religion and uh, values and everything. So it is still a raging debate in Tunisia. People are using it, uh, uh, like I said, to score points. Uh, uh, but uh, there is a, a, a commission of liberties that is that has presented a very very nice project uh, for uh, um, debate. And uh, now, uh, when the conservatives want to mock this uh, um, uh, commission, they call it Bushra's commission. Bushra Abul Hajj Ahmeda is the uh, is the uh, head of the. She's a, uh, a human rights activist. This subject has been debate has uh, the debate on this subject started as early as the late 80s by the femme democrat uh, association women Dem democrats and 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 uh, they the argue the, their main argument that equality and in inheritance will really benefit or be beneficial to women who are economically disadvantaged who come from poor families more than the other the part of the well off women is big enough but it's really the poor women that suffer from inequality and inheritance thank you very much we can't hear you okay sorry sorry we have thank you samia we have a point raised by humai uh, about uh, the uh, global campaign to reform the family law uh, headed by mustawa of course we are very familiar with the work of Musawa and uh, some of us in the region are members uh, in, the, um, in the steering committee and also uh, following uh, all the activities. I have uh, one name in my mind, uh, Dr. Hatun Al-Fasi uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, other women. So uh, about the Mustawa campaign, if anyone from the speakers who want to add anything uh, or to clarify any points? Any one of the speakers want to talk about uh, a relationship with Musawa or the uh, campaign or to reform the family law by Musawa or any connection to this campaign? Um, I just wanted to say yes. I mean, we're very much following, and some of us are, are um, closely connected with the Musawa. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think, I mean, what what they are doing in and also producing uh, the enlightened interpretation are very much helpful. Um, uh, and we are are trying our best, although you know some of the. Um, uh, feminist movement in the Arab countries uh, are very much uh, towards the secular uh, reform. So they say, I mean, uh, really, if we depend on uh, using the enlightened uh, interpretation in order to convince uh, those who have the power of uh, reforming or changing the family law, that is going to take a long, long time. So they are focusing more on a secular issue and saying also uh, in some uh, countries is like let's have two things let's have a, a family law that is totally secular and let's have a family law that has you know a, a religious interpretation uh, and let women choose which one they can really uh, apply or implement when they are uh, getting married so that's that's what's happening, but but this, I mean, uh, we value very much, you know, all the, the efforts that Musawa is doing as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatma. We have uh, from Brianti um, uh, uh, sort okay. of questions uh, to Samia, uh, or related to what Samia is. Uh, it is about uh, if there are any members of the coalition who are engaging with the international financial architecture. Maybe Dr. Fatma again. 
Uh, actually, I must confess, we, we don't have a relationship with the international financial architect, but I think uh, maybe Morocco, um, Tunisia, because they're much more advanced uh, in uh, calling for equal uh, inheritance rights. That would be a very good idea if I've, I've not linked actually with the uh, international financial architecture. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity, Samia, uh, for also uh, uh, linking our network with the, with with these structures. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, like a, a rather comment, uh, more than a question, by Pooja uh, Kapai, who speaks about the asylum seekers coming from the region, uh, and uh, uh, she says that. Uh, the in interventions uh, today give uh, um, um, some information about the status of these asylum seekers and the status of uh, uh, violence uh, uh, addressing women or targeting women. Uh, okay, anyone wants to comment on uh, Puja? Well, I, I think it's very important, and this is what we aspire as a network, in, a feminist network in the Arab region, to really link with other uh, uh, great efforts like what uh, Pooja is, uh, is saying. Uh, and uh, um, let's actually exchange our contacts and let's also exchange all what we are producing so that we can really uh, maximize the benefit that women uh, can have. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, I have now uh, Pooja's email uh, and I think uh, we, we're going to have it in our network and we would like also to uh, uh, exchange all our uh, experiences, documents and so on uh, with you and with Eura, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. Uh, any more comments or questions before we conclude this session? Let me see if we have any other comments or questions. We have lots of solidarities from the participants, which is very soothing and, you know, uh, it's uh, something very precious to have. Uh, okay, let me express my great attitude, my great gratitude and uh, thanks for the organizers of this wonderful conference, even uh, during uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, the, the uh, precarious health situation around in the world. Uh, uh, yet we managed to get together and exchange our experiences and know about each uh, other. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, thanking also the speakers, and thank the audience for uh, the, uh, the, the good questions and stimulating uh, questions they, uh, they, uh, they gave us, and also about the, uh, the very insightful comments uh, to the different uh, speakers. Uh, thank you all again. And I announce the closure of this session in the hope that we will meet again soon uh, on another uh, uh, area. Thank you. Grand Thank you. Dr. Islah. It's a pleasure. Now we close the session and we move to the following uh, session. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.